My name is Sarah Erny. I'm a data scientist with Pivotal. I'm here today with my colleagues um, Botson and Jared. Um, and we're here to present on data science, um, essentially a primer on how to take data-driven action focused heavily on streaming data. Um, we'll go through use cases in um, the space of kind of sensors and um, Twitter data. Um, starting off with a very high level overview of the types of approaches and tools that are required um, to perform data science on the types of um, data sets that will be described. Kind of a very high level overview of um, when you think about the different types of data assets that you have, what some of the challenges might be, particularly with sensor data that you'll be facing um, and how you might address those. Um, moving on to, into a text analytics use case, um, specifically Watson will present on working with Twitter data and how to deal with that at scale with a large distributed system, um, building both models and then scoring those as they come in. And then finally, Jared will end with um, real-time monitoring and prediction on sensor data, again, dealing with scalability issues um, that you may run into and how to build these models at scale. I think for starters, it's always good to kind of level set on why it matters um, that we're paying attention to what's happening in the space of streaming data and large volumes of sensors. So our everyday devices that we have, they talk to us. Um, many of us have phones that are smartphones, and we might have different wearables, um, Fitbit, Jawbone, um, Misfits, so various devices that you wear that are tracking things about you. Um, even your iPhone will do that. Um, we have devices around us that do that as well. Um, Nest, for example, or with things of scale that actually pays attention to what's happening day to day where you provide it with measurements um, when you kind of get near it. Um, and then we have things like cars, Tesla, that are actually quite aware of what's happening. They have sensors and are gathering information and data. So really, those devices tell us what's going on um, to ourselves, to things that we are using. But what we're really interested in as well is to not only have those devices communicate to us so that we take action, but they communicate with each other and take seamless action. And in order to do that, there are a lot of different um, kind of projects out there or initiatives that are paying attention to that. So if this, then that, um, that second logo has actually been around for quite some time. Um, it's a way for you to have things kind of automate, lights turn on when you come home, for example, detect your presence with um, Wi-Fi. Um, we also have this visible Tesla, which is a guy who hacks his Tesla. It's very interesting. Um, he'll do things like if he shows up to a grocery store and um, the Tesla kind of notes, hey, you're at Safeway, it sends him a text message to remind him to get his bags out of his trunk so that he doesn't have to buy um, or use, I guess, um, either paper or plastic bags, which are no longer allowed in San Francisco. Um, of course, Weave, which is Google's new initiative to allow you to have your Android devices kind of a nice way for you to build on top of what's available. Um, again, to allow your devices to interact with each other. So yes, that's really great. Um, we know what the future may hold for us in terms of our home. Um, it's possible that we have our devices when our alarm clock goes off, it's gonna start brewing coffee for us. Um, if something goes bad in your refrigerator, our refrigerator is smart enough to then add it to a list on your iPhone for when you go grocery shopping. That's great. Those are things that in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives will probably make everything easier. But really, we want to move far, far beyond that. Um, there are a lot of things in our environment um, that can be affected as well. So you know, what if we could actually sense that there might be some disaster happening on oil rig and we could prevent um, the loss of you know, tons of um, gallons of fuel, but not just that, like the effect that it's having on, on the world around us. So really what we want to do is have smart devices that speak to us, but also kind of shut things down and understand how to regulate um, maybe the world around us, but also um, kind of pay attention to what's happening um, on, a, on a less convenience and more kind of matter of fact level. Now those are a couple examples. One of them I think is in the connected home space. The other one I think is on the other end, which is you know, very uh, macro level challenges. But really pretty much everything in our world today um, is producing tons of data. So billions of data points exist everywhere from um, you know, medical space where we have data coming off of sensors in a hospital room um, data that's coming off of images, which are not just limited to what actually is being collected in terms of, you know, there's the presence or absence of some sort of a lesion in this image. But even, you know, there's some vibrations. There might be something wrong with your machine. We might have to do some maintenance here. Um, of course, on the other side, we have smart grids um, paying attention to what's being consumed. And um, Jared, in particular, would talk to these types of sensor data um, and, and what might be done with those. Now, although we're not going to cover this in too much detail in terms of the types of frameworks and systems that have to be available and what, what architectures support this, we'll have some examples of you know, how it's been done in these use cases. But um, one thing kind of not on the data side, but of course on the technology side that you have to pay attention to is how to ingest this data, how to take action in a meaningful amount of time, and have those response rates. 
Um, so while you know the alarm clock turning on your coffee maker might not be so critical, something like knowing when to shut off kind of the gas that's coming out because something's going wrong actually is. Um, you know, in the medical space, what we care a lot about, um, which is the domain I focus a lot on, is how to turn a signal into something meaningful um, to prevent some sort of a um, really a negative outcome that could occur. So on the data science side, what we need to do is not only understand how to get that data in, of course, how do you arrive at receiving signals in a, in a meaningful amount of time and being able to respond to it, but how do you actually identify that signal that's valuable that allows you to elicit some sort of an important response? Um, so here we have an ECG measure that's kind of showing you what's happening. Um, it's from a de device called a live core that you can actually attach to the back of your phone. Um, it's used in the field to try and detect things like stroke. Um, but the question is, how do you take that signal and turn it into something meaningful? So how do you identify that that sort of second half of that signal, um, where you're seeing some sort of a device that has sensors, um, turn into something like an action? So either what we have here is something that's, uh, where's my mouse? either a, a bit unimportant. So if we look at the far left, you know, that's actually nothing abnormal. Maybe you started running, maybe you walked up some stairs, and that's what we're seeing here. This is something that, you know, might be a little bit bad. You should probably alert your doctor, have you come in for a checkup, or something real. This could be a stroke. Uh, you might not even be able to react anymore. Let's call an ambulance to the location where you are. But what's critical is when you're looking at these types of signals, you have to ask a lot of questions. When building a model that is going to take an action, um, one that could be really, you know, life-saving action, or it could be what we call a false positive, something that's costing a lot to the system by you know, bringing an ambulance here. Um, how do you make those determinations of when to take action, when it's reasonable, um, how the data is being collected in terms of what you can trust and what else is available to you, um, and then how do you actually build that model that can identify something's wrong? So in the first part of this 90-minute focus session, what I'm really going to spend time with is kind of those questions around what's needed in order for you to go after any type of problem like this, whether it be you know, with something that's sensor data um, or something that might be just streaming in. Um, specifically, what it is that's required in terms of building a model at scale. So we have a lot of data coming in. What are the challenges with working with that data? Specifically, when it's so large, how are we going to actually build a model off of that? Um, the next is kind of that question between trade-off and accuracy, what I mentioned. Um, you know, do we have a lot of false positives? Do we cost the system a lot by calling for ambulances that are unnecessary? Or do we kind of have a lot of uh, false negatives? So cases that kind of pass through and go unnoticed, um, but might have really sort of horrific outcomes if they're missed. And then finally, really decide how we can drive insight. So action that's driven is not necessarily always an automated, low latency triggered action. It could actually be something where you make a decision, oh, I learned something. And actually, this now means I should collect different data. It means that there's something in my process that may be changed um, or changeable. So how can I understand what the root cause is? Is it something that I actually have uh, the ability to affect? Throughout of all of this, I'm really going to focus heavily on these data-driven paradigms. So what it is that you have to do in order to allow the data to speak to you as opposed to asking questions of it and trying to prove those by testing many hypotheses. And everything around having to clean data, transform it, and what we call feature engineering, trying to identify how I turn this signal, this set of you know, sensor data that's coming in into something that allows me to predict at the, at the end. <clears throat> I'm going to do this by focusing on a variety of use cases. So I went over kind of the patient treatment side a little bit at a high level, and we'll kind of come back to that in, in the sense of kind of vision of the future of what that means. Um, and Jared will provide you with some links at the end for use cases that you can check out online. Um, but I want to go more specifically into some um, a little bit specific, but hopefully something that's quite understandable use cases in um, oil drilling and manufacturing. So while that might not be your particular domain, hopefully the concept of using the sensor data and understanding what it means to need to transform that will resonate well. So let's start off with that oil drilling use case. So I'm, not, I'm not sure if anyone here is in the oil and gas space, um, but in almost any space, um, there's actually a ton of data that's being generated. And um, data itself just has a lot of intrinsic value because in addition to kind of providing you with answers to something, it's an opportunity to do something more, um, to transform your industry or what it is that you're doing today. Now, in oil and gas, there's a large amount of data that's been generated for a long time off of sensors. And specifically in the use case that I'm speaking to, which was executed by a colleague um, at Pivotal Rashmi on our data science side, um, it, she was working with large amounts of sensor data um, to try and predict what might happen um, on the maintenance side. So can we predict that there would be something that might go wrong with this oil rig? Which means, you know, if it happens while I'm actually drilling, that could have a really awful effect. If you think about, you know, being unable to extract that 
uh, drill itself once it's kind of lodged in place if I could just have replaced it first and be able to work my way backwards and, and kind of avoid um, what's estimated to be billions of dollars annually that are lost um, in, in this sort of lack of predictive maintenance. Um, ultimately, what, what we have are, again, a set of sensor points and some outcomes that we're trying to predict so that if we know that this might be happening in the near future, I might want to sort of take action, make some changes. And going back to our earlier um, sort of statements on what it is that we want to focus on, um, I'll be walking through this particular use case by talking about kind of the various components that we have to consider if we want to create one of these predictive maintenance models. Um, so specifically in how I deal with the different data sets that are coming in and how to integrate and clean those up so that I might be able to drive an action. Um, how I transform that data into something reasonable so that I can create what we call again features to be able to predict some outcome and the specific models. So how I build those particular models. Now the use case itself, um, which again is out of the oil and gas space, is trying to work with data that's coming off of sensors to predict that there would be a failure in the future. And what we have is a window of time um, that has zero failures followed by one particular failure instance. And we were trying to understand, is it possible to know at what point I will be able to predict that there is going to be a failure and stop the rig to try and fix that potential failure that may happen. Now in this particular use case, um, the primary data sources that came in were coming in at a different cadence. So the things that are coming off the sensor, for example, how quickly that particular drill is penetrating into the earth, meaning the rate of it going down in um, as they're trying to get down to where the oil source is, the rotations per minute, so how quickly that drill is spinning, and the weight on bit, so how sort of much pressure is being applied to it. Those are data sources that are coming off of sensors, so they're being collected very rapidly, lots of data coming in there. Um, now, although this might seem kind of simplistic, um, on the other side we have operator data. So those are things that are entered a, sort of far less frequently and need to be integrated um, at the most simple level, applied kind of at the same frequency within that other um, higher cadence data set. So the, some of those include those failure details themselves, kind of what happened and why it happened, um, the components, so whether or not I have a certain drill bit, for example, that's being used. Um, but in reality, what we have, um, if we look at kind of that higher frequency data that's being collected on the sensors here, that rate of penetration over time, um, what we have are these particular drill bit changes that are taking place. Now, knowing what drill bit is being used could be a feature that I want to use in predicting whether or not a failure will happen in the next window. So it could be that a certain type of drill bit in a certain type of environment with a certain amount of weight could cause a failure, and that, in fact, I would maybe want to not use that. But in order to know that, um, sort of the very most simple basic thing, you have to apply that, that knowledge, that ability of knowing the drill bit change took place here. Now all of these other sensor data should have this particular feature attached to them. I know this seems quite simple, um, but it's something that has to be considered in any one of these data sets, and it's actually something that's quite prevalent um, when you have different sensors coming in. Now I think on the cleansing side, that's where things get a little bit more tricky, um, especially when we start thinking about what it is that we want to achieve. So the data here that we're looking at is pretty messy. Um, and I think like the human eye can look at this and see, OK, in terms of weight on bit, um, the sensor is measuring two different things, um, sort of two actions that have taken place. So if you look kind of across the two windows there um, that are visual, there's probably one particular sort of manual setting that has one weight that is then being changed over time. I mean, if that's something that you want to drive and understand that there's a difference between what's happening in one section versus another, you would have to identify that. And you wouldn't necessarily want to do that in a fully manual way because there's a lot of noise attached to all of these sensors. So it's possible that there are some little noises in the actual sensor's ability to detect what's going on or that there's some other kind of unmeasured latent variables that are being captured with that particular sensor. Now, in terms of processing that data, if we would want to kind of smooth that out um, and separate what we're seeing in terms of events to be able to track them separately and maybe build models separately there, well, one thing you might want to do really simplistically is compute an average across that and say, am I below or above that average, even if it's a median. Well, that doesn't work um, because what's going to happen is we're going to end up with these two sets that are actually kind of mixed within each other. And you and I, by looking at that, can actually tell that that's not how you would want to separate this data. In fact, you would want to separate it kind of along, time zone, well, along the time axis where you can see that, that split, that change taking place. And then actually there are probably these two other averages that you're hoping to consider. 
Well, in terms of being able to process that data, and this is just one example where we're looking at a short window, you would have to take advantage of the ability to be able to look over windows of time and smooth that data set. And in fact, what you might want to do is compute something like a, a window function across that. So being able to look at um, potentially averages, which are fast to compute, uh, meaning it's a little bit more painful, but you want to look over windows of time and see what's happening there, smooth out that data, and remove some of this noise. So these are some of the really common things that have to happen with almost any sensor data that you bring in, because ultimately what you're going to get is not going to be clean. And when you think about working at it at scale, you're not going to be able to necessarily program that to come in. You're going to be need to, needing to stream in that data, take action on Windows, and then decide what it is that you want to do with it. Um, so very frequently, we take care, uh, we make use of um, our distributed database to be able to take that window functionality, maybe toss the max and the min across each window and compute the average on that remaining. Um, here we're showing a window across uh, 21 data points, um, again, tossing out the min and the max and taking that average. Again, just an example, but some of the things that you would want to consider when you're going after one of these problems. So we have a very short amount of time, which means I'm only going to touch on a few elements here. Um, so moving forward from integration and cleansing, let's move on to feature building. So feature building, I think, is probably um, arguably one of the most exciting things about any data science project. Um, I think it's the part that allows you to be the most creative and think about what it is that you as a person think is very informative or predictive of what's going to happen. So here what I have are a bunch of images um, of various different sensors. Um, and I think one of them is actually a setting. Um, I'm not, they're all sensors, um, that are showing you sort of what those sensors are reading. And what I can tell you is these are all across the same timeline on the same rigs. And at the very end of this window, there is a failure that's happening. So I think, again, when we look at this, um, what we would want to do is be able to say, if we take a bunch of windows over time here, we know that there are no failures across many of them. But at the very last window, we know that there's a failure at the end. So how do we turn all of these little sensors to be able to say, OK, in the future, I would be able to say what happens. So if I take some time slice right here, I'd be able to say in the next 30 minutes, 30 seconds, what's going to be happening. Now, if we look at something like bit position, um, it might be a little bit challenging to see. But I think what we would have is potentially a way of transforming this into something that would be real signal. So if we look sort of at the bottom and moving up, what we see is kind of what looks to be quite a clean line, which is increasing a lot. But if we're looking at kind of the variability of what's happening there, there is an increased variability in terms of how we're increasing. So if we look at the change, the delta over time, um, there seem to be these high variances that are, are kind of being introduced. Um, in the RPM, we're seeing something quite similar, where what we have is kind of windows of time, where if, again, we look at the, uh, the standard deviation of, of what's available in any particular window, um, we can see that there are a lot more outliers. And so that would be something that could be captured that way. So these are instances where you're taking windows of time and figuring out how you're going to take a whole bunch of data and turn it into something that can represent a feature or an attribute about a window of data that could then be predictive. So it could be something like you know, the standard deviation um, over time in a particular window that's actually predictive if it's high of a failure occurring in the future. So again, we're going through this quite quickly, but it's, it's kind of that fun, that, uh, that part that allows you to play a little bit with the data and understand and, and kind of inject that human element of how it is that I would want to interpret that data in order to get something out of it. Now, all of these types of features that you're going to want to build, um, they can actually now be used specifically once you take all of these windows, extract all of those features, and have that predictive model. At this window, no failure occurred. At this window, a failure did occur. Um, how can I now turn that into a model? So once I've extracted all of these features, how can I then use that to predict what will happen in the future? Now, here at the top, we have our um, prediction of equipment failure, um, which again, that is one of those use cases that I just covered, but is amongst many other use cases that you might actually be interested in um, using. So um, other ones might require different types of algorithms, so different types of approaches for actually um, predicting what's happening. With an equipment failure, what we're looking at is a change. So we have a binary outcome, either yes, a failure occurred, or no, a failure did not occur. Um, so what we kind of want to provide you with are some different algorithms or approaches that are appropriate for these types of questions. So in any instance where you're trying to ask, did something occur or not occur? Um, here we have the example of a failure. It could be something like a heart attack. It could be something like, um, I don't know, there are any variety of them. Someone responded to uh, an offer or not. It could be in any domain. But it's something where there's an outcome. 
In some in instances, there could be multiple choices um, that are the outcome. The appropriate types of algorithms there are classifiers. Um, and we're listing a few examples here. So logistic regression being um, one of the most simple ones, um, what we call a regularized version of that. So one that actually tries to penalize the number of features that we just described. You can make many of those, try to penalize that and keep that as short as possible. Um, or support vector machines, which allow you to go into this crazy, amazing, complex, multidimensional space and sort of understand any interaction terms that it's the weight on bits and the RPM together that become very important. So just a sample of the types of algorithms um, that you might go after. Uh, generally available in many programming languages, but we'll have a couple examples of um, open source ones that are available to you. Um, predicting the remaining life of equipment, um, something similar to trying to predict whether or not an earthquake will happen um, over some timeline, um, is something that could be solved using Cox proportional hazard regression. Um, again, available in a variety of different um, toolboxes. Um, finally, trying to predict how quickly that drill bit is going to penetrate into the earth is something um, that is on that continuous sort of outcome variable. Um, so that's something that a linear regression, a regularized version of that linear regression, very similar to what we saw at the top there, um, and support vector machines can in some ways be used in this space as well. Um, so just a few examples of how you might be wanting to go after this in terms of algorithms. Now, although there are many different toolboxes available out there, um, I think some instances that we run into are um, here when we're dealing with trillions of rows of data and potentially hundreds or thousands of different features, we're, de we're dealing with a very large volume of data. And sort of back in the day, certainly when I started in this space, um, I would do most of that work on my laptop or maybe on a cluster. Um, but in reality, what you're having to do is figure out how to do parts of that work in contained little spaces, do sampling, do it on a subset of the data. And really what that means is you're, you're potentially losing signal, um, or you're not allowing yourself to maybe take advantage of the variety of different situations that are available to build multiple of these different types of methods. So what we've had to do um, at Pivotal is think a lot about how we deal with scaling this up so that we can do it at scale in a large distributed system so we don't have to throw away some of that data. So I wanted to introduce you to the um, concept of uh, streaming linear regression. So how would I be able to compute um, in this instance, we'll take how quickly a drill bit would penetrate into the earth using a bunch of different variables um, and do that in a fast way by using distributed compute and in a way that doesn't limit me to only having to sample or take a subset of the data. I think at a very high level, this is um, a nice way to represent conceptually what it is that a linear regression is trying to accomplish. Um, and we'll just take the example of having one, um, what we call um, feature or um, independent variable here. So those of you that maybe come from more statistical background might use that. Um, so on the x-axis here, we have the weight on bit. And I think it's a safe assumption um, that if you put a lot of weight on a bit, um, the drill might go down to the earth a lot faster. So that's what we've pl plotted on the y-axis there. And what we're saying is that we are assuming that there's some sort of dependency. So if I apply more weight on that bit, then I'll go faster into the earth. But I might not know how much more, so how much speed is associated or, um, with, with sort of adding that weight. What's more is you might have multiple features that affect that and a combination of those as well. So when you're trying to fit any sort of model um, here, linear regression, what you're essentially trying to do is minimize that line. So what we're trying to do is create a line, if you remember back to sort of your algebra days, um, predict what the kind of uh, coefficient there would be that allows you to, to generate that slope. And then essentially what you're trying to do is minimize the error, there's the squares of the errors, so that every point is as close as possible to that line across all of the data that you have available. And essentially what you're doing is solving a big system of equations, trying to minimize the distances across it, or the squared distances, um, which sort of, if you have multiple of these features, you would do it with multiple features. Now that can actually be done with a closed form solution, um, which looks like scarier math than it actually is down in the corner, but if you break it, break it down kind of piece by piece, some of the things that you might be doing, for example, um, in solving that equation would be to just take x here being your feature vectors. So for every example of a, of a sensor that's capturing how quickly I'm going into the Earth and the data that's being captured in terms of that sensors, um, so y being how quickly it's going in and x being all of the different sensors that are being measured, you're basically going to sum across all of those, in this case, just multiplications of each vector by its own rate of penetration, and there's another one where you're actually doing the feature vector against itself. Now you have trillions of rows of data that can be challenging to do on your laptop, and not only that, you're doing it in parallel because ultimately 
the sum of any set of anything is just the sum of those components happening independently and then having that sort of aggregate at the end. So the way we solve this problem is by, in effect, taking this data and splitting it up. So we store this data in a database um, where each row now is representing each training example, meaning it has that Y, that rate of penetration, and all of the different Xs or those features that you've engineered now. And you're storing that so that each of those rows can be distributed across your database. So it has a subset of the data on each. And in fact, you can perform those sums in parallel across each one of those segments and then just take that sum at the end as needed. So what's nice about that is number one, you're no longer worrying about the fact that all of this data needs to be loaded up because in fact, each one of those summations can be done independently just by reading that row in and executing that particular um, transformation here as a uh, SQL query. Um, and number two, it's done in a distributed fashion. The data is just being computed across all of those nodes in parallel. What results is the ability to do these regressions across tons of data um, at, at a speed that's kind of incredible when you think about it. Um, and this is something that you can check out at madlib.net, and I know um, we sort of didn't go into too much detail, but it's just one example of how um, our own open source machine learning library, um, which was started together um, in a collaboration at Berkeley, solves this sort of problem of being able to do any sort of modeling at scale in a distributed system. Um, as I mentioned, this is just one of a set of different types of um, open source tools that we use um, at Pivotal when we do these types of exercises. Um, and again, Botson and Jared will be covering some of those others. Now, just really quickly wanted to kind of cover how this can also be done in other types of spaces. So I gave the example of oil drilling, which of course is very specific, but exists in a lot of different industries. So in pharma in particular, um, we've done projects where we're working with manufacturing data. Um, a whole bunch of different sensors from an extremely long process, which we don't need to worry about, multiple different science-y steps occurring. And many of those science-y steps have sensors, and those sensors are once again producing data. It could be the duration of something, it could be kind of the pressure or the temperature that's varying, and again, we're trying to predict the outcome of something after looking at a whole bunch of data. Lots of opportunities to potentially correct an outcome. Oh, you know, we have a bad vaccine batch, how did that happen? Um, figuring out what it was that actually is predictive, and then going back and changing those things. And then finally, knowing at what point in that pipeline, turns out this pipeline that we were working on was a six month pipeline. So if I can predict with a lot of accuracy in the last two weeks, probably wasted a lot of time and energy on predicting that. Um, and it's sort of uncorrectable. So ultimately, again, if we look at this um, with vaccine potency, we have an instance of being able to build one of these regressions. Um, you have kind of the true potency or quality of that vaccine. And what we predict, what we want to do is do a really good job of seeing what we did predict and what it actually is. Um, same sort of steps, working about integrating that data, um, building features. So looking across the time of any particular step and saying, OK, you know, this was the variation of pressure. This was the mean temperature. What was it that was looking at what we were looking at? And then thinking about what's tunable. So if it's something like temperature, that's probably something I'd be able to control. If it's something like counting the number of cells that I'm seeing on a plate, probably not something I can control, but might let me make a decision I'm going to dump this vaccine batch and not spend the remaining maybe four months on, on processing it. Um, in terms of models, introducing a few more algorithms here that might be of interest, partially squares, random forest, and again, that regularized regression we discussed. So just sort of more considerations for you here um, in terms of thinking about what it is that you want to do when you're building any sort of model. Um, essentially, what you want to do is think about what features, when you build your model, end up being important and tunable. So going back and interrogating your model and asking which ones were shown by the algorithm to be really important are those things that you can now change and therefore influence how sort of good any sort of outcome will be. And second, um, are there these opportunities to be able to identify at what point in the pipeline or what moment, what sort of your latency is for, for reaction? So I think bringing them back around um, to sort of the high level concept that we started with, which, which is how sensor data can affect healthcare outcomes um, and, and sort of thinking about that space moving forward as well. Um, I, th I think when we focus on healthcare, we focus a lot on kind of hospital settings and places where we're collecting just a ton of data about our, our patients and sort of getting that 360 degree view of them. In reality, what happens is you come to the doctor and they get a lot of measurements about you, um, things that are pretty high fidelity, but 
sort of happening at, at less frequency than you would like. So maybe, yes, I get some images, I get some measurements from lab values, but it'll be a really long time until I find out some more about you. In reality, what we have are people that have very infrequent visits and therefore very little data that's being collected about you in terms of, over time, what we're measuring. So we're not really seeing this kind of increase in opportunity that um, I think Jared and Watson will speak to in other spaces. I think it's worse is I think all of us have an, a tendency to kind of behave a bit better when we know that there's a doctor's appointment coming up. When I go to the dentist, I'll floss my teeth a lot more in the two days, three weeks maybe leading up to it. But certainly that's the same thing that we see here. People might behave better with blood glucose, kind of eat better. What we're not getting is the sort of frequency um, that's needed in order to capture what's really going on with a patient. So although we're getting better at looking at patient data, um, I think kind of in an inpatient setting, all these problems that were mentioned in the sensor space for um, you know, vaccine manufacturing, oil and gas, um, are slowly also showing up in, in that healthcare space. So even if this uh, sort of initial set of examples and the ones that are to follow, um, if you're sort of passionate about the healthcare space, seem like something that's a bit distant and not as accessible, um, in reality, that's something that's coming up pretty rapidly as well. So um, a lot of wearables, a lot of different moni monitors that are available for you to be able to see kind of what can be gathered about patients and, and how you can build those predictive models. So uh, with that, I'll end and let Watson come up to cover um, NLP um, in distributed systems. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. So uh, with that nice background from Sarah on what open source tools you can use and what sort of feature engineering model building processes you can follow to derive insights from your data, let's look at one specific example of a pipeline for doing natural language processing on some real world data to solve business problems. So in this particular case, we are going to look at uh, how do you do sentiment analysis using open source libraries while also parallelizing them in an infrastructure like an MPP environment, which stands for Massively par Parallel Processing Environment. So first off, uh, what sort of business use cases dictate the need for sentiment analysis? Everybody does sentiment analysis, be it for movie reviews or detecting customers' opinion. But uh, in, in, in our instance, we work directly with customers, and we were guided by real-world actual use cases which, you know, for whom the customers had a lot of value of doing sentiment analysis. So one example is a major telecom company who wanted to identify what is the likelihood of a customer recommending their service to a friend or a member of their family, given their prior history. You know, you have information about customer demographics, you have about information about their rate plans and what have you, but what they wanted to see is, is there any valuable information in call center transcriptions that can be used to bump the accuracy of a model? So what we did for this customer was we took all that call center transcriptions and we did sentiment analysis to identify a customer's satisfaction score based on those conversations, and we also identified what are the topics of conversation uh, per customer. So for instance, if you are in a sales role, maybe a phone call is more important to, to you than, say, browsing or using you know, um, the internet as much as you would want to. So in those scenarios, if I can detect that you're frequently calling about dropped calls, then your likelihood to recommend that carrier would be far lower than someone who's not concerned so much about dropped calls, but is only concerned about their rate plan you know, whether the internet is working on the device, so on and so forth. So we did some sentiment and topic analysis for this, and we'll talk about uh, what pipeline we built and what processes we followed and what models we built shortly. Another great example of uh, the applicability of sentiment analysis, especially at scale, was for a customer who wanted to see if there was signal in Twitter to predict commodity futures like wheat, corn, and soybean. Now, you might wonder, that might be crazy, because why would you look for something you know, in, on Twitter where perhaps people are mostly bragging or complaining about things? Uh, why not use something which is more fundamental, like you know, the agricultural yield predictions, or weather data, or you know, actual estimates which is released by the Department of Agriculture? Now, the answer is that 
if you can get any slight advantage by extracting signal out of Twitter, you're going to be doing much better than your competitors, and you can hedge against any future fluctuations in corn and soybean and wheat prices. So sentiment analysis of tweets, especially those coming from farmers. Today, you know, everybody is connected to the internet. You have a lot of high tech in, in the agricultural space, and a lot of farmers are actually tweeting about crop conditions, uh, you know, how the weather might affect their yield, so on and so forth. And the sooner you can use that signal to predict the price of uh, you know, corn, wheat, or soybean in future, the better advantage you have over your competitors. So speaking of platform and tools that we use to uh, do all this analysis, we'll touch upon some of the things which Sarah spoke of previously. Uh, so any data science uh, engagement that when we work with our customers involves this sort of a pipeline wherein you have data coming from a multitude of sources. Some could be structured, some could be unstructured. And of course, you have machine-generated data these days. You ingest that into a data lake using a tool like Spring XD. And Spring XD is not new to most of you. You've probably attended a bunch of other sessions as well. And it gives us the ability to apply any sort of filtering we may need. And we can just dump that data into HDFS, where you know, if you consider a Hadoop, uh, a Hadoop distributed file system as your data lake. Once we've dumped all the relevant data of interest into this data lake, we use uh, you know, SQL engines like Hawk, which is a SQL on Hadoop engine. We also use the Greenplum da database, which is an enterprise database, a data warehouse, actually. Both of these are going to be open source uh, by the end of this month. And in, on top of this platform, we use machine learning libraries in R, Python, Java, whatever you, uh, you know, whatever might be your favorite programming language. We can use a whole lot of libraries in these corresponding ecosystems while also parallelizing them with very little effort. And we'll see how we do that for sentiment analysis. Once we've built these models, we can build a dashboard which consumes the results of the model to communicate business insights to a customer. So for instance, in the commodity futures prediction scenario, you could have a dashboard which recommends a person when would it be a good time to buy a certain commodity and at what price, when would it be a good time to sell a commodity, and what factors went into that decision making. And we typically build these applications and host it on Cloud Foundry, which again, you know, uh, you can uh, Google about, and it's really great. And uh, you can focus on your application and far less on ensuring that it is highly available, it does load balancing, and things of that nature. So let's start with, you know, these elements one by one, right? So the most important thing of this whole uh, pipeline is, is the parallel um, MPP system. So it's a massively parallel processing system. It's shared nothing. So you have a master node. You can think of it as a collection of Postgres servers, except that uh, the servers can communicate to each other, and they're not you know, operating completely independently. So you have a master node, and then you have a bunch of segment nodes. And the way we achieve data parallelism, so for problems which are embarrassingly parallel, where a given task can be split into n number of subtasks, and each of those subtasks don't have a lot of communication that has to happen between each other. In other words, there is no real dependency between those subtasks. Uh, those fall under the realm of data parallel problems or embarrassingly parallel problems. And the way we solve these on the MPP environment is through procedural extensions to languages like Python, R, Java, uh, you know, be it C, C++, or even PG SQL, for instance. So what procedural languages do is you, know, you have the interpreters or the, the, the executables for the corresponding languages like Python, R, or Java, which reside on every segment node. And then any task is given from the master node, you can invoke the corresponding embedded uh, you know, interpreter for Python or Java, for instance, to execute code on a subset of data and ultimately collate the results and present it back to the master. Here's how a user-defined function in a procedural language looks like. So it's not going to be any different from any function you would write in R or Python, for instance. So it starts with a function definition. This is mostly the SQL wrapper, which basically tells you know, what data types in SQL maps into what data types in the, sor in the source language. And then within the double dollar sign, you write the actual function in your source language. So if it is Python in this scenario, you just write pure Python code. If it is Java, you can just call a Java class. And with C, C++, you can again uh, you know, invoke it as so. And ultimately, you wrap it up with a language definition, a declaration itself, which is where you say language PL Python. So when I'm using language PL Java, I would just say language PL Java U. 
So what libraries do we typically use in, in, in these procedural language libraries, right? So for instance, in the Python ecosystem, you have the SkyKit Learn library, you have NumPy, you have stats models, and you have a, a whole lot of brilliant libraries. Likewise with R, you have about 4,000 libraries which are used by statistical uh, machine learning folks in, in the CRAN repository, and we can make use of all of those. In, in the Java uh, ecosystem, we can make use of Core NLP from Stanford, which has a lot of natural language processing capabilities. We can use Mallet from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And then there's, of course, uh, Apache Open NLP and a whole bunch of other libraries. So we make use of all of these in our uh, you know, projects. Let me expand this a little bit so that it's... All right, so for, for model parallel problems where you want to build one model out of all your data, we use what Sarah mentioned previously, which is the Madlib machine learning library. What was that? All right, that looks much better. And then, of course, for any sort of application that you build you know, using text analytics, you would want to expose some underlying corpus through a search interface, so you need some search capabilities, you need some information retrieval capabilities, and for that we use a, um, a, a toolkit called GPText, which is based off of Apache Solar. So it allows you to index any collection of documents while querying that index using SQL. And we'll see how all of these things you know, fit together ultimately. So let's come back to sentiment analysis of tweets. We saw some business use cases for it. Now let's talk about what are the challenges involved with sentiment analysis of tweets and how do we accomplish it using some of the open source libraries. So first off, uh, you know, language on Twitter doesn't adhere to a lot of syntactic rules that most people might be familiar with. And if you take any off-the-shelf uh, component for doing sentiment analysis and apply it to Twitter, you're going to see that it's not going to perform really well. So any library that you use has to be the state of the art and it should be customized for Twitter alone because of the nature of the language and given the 140 character limitations which makes a lot of people very creative in fitting as much content as possible in 140 characters. So on the top uh, you actually see a tweet which contains a lot of abbreviations, it contains words with vowels removed so that it can fit into 140 characters. Now secondly, um, the, the data so long as you have supervised information, so in Sarah's previous example where she spoke about the drill bit prediction, right, predicting the failure of a mud motor uh, you know, in, 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 a, in an oil drilling scenario, you have supervised data. So you have examples of prior runs of a motor which ultimately resulted in a failure and prior runs which did not result in failure. With sentiment analysis, you can either collect a collection, of, you know, take a long list of tweets and have some human annotated with a sentiment score, like you could give it a positive or a negative score, and then train a regression model or a classification model for predicting the sentiment associated with new tweets. But in most scenarios, you don't have that luxury of one human being annotating a large volume of data. And as you, your topics of conversations in the, twi um, in the tweets change, your models will no longer perform accurately. So we need some sort of unsupervised approach to identifying a sentiment score with tweets. So that's one challenge. And finally, you know, you, you might think, you might have heard a lot of people speak about sentiment analysis just being a problem of looking up uh, positive and negative words from a dictionary and then ultimately coming up with a score. Now the challenge with that is it is not very accurate because context is king. And without context, the sentiment of a tweet cannot be really inferred. So if you take, for instance, a very positive word like, uh, um, well, let's take a negative word, for instance, like unpredictable, right? So in, in a dictionary of positive and negative words, unpredictable might be a negative word because if something is unpredictable, it gives you fear, there's uncertainty. So in the context of a movie review, if a movie is unpredictable, you, you know, it is actually positive, although the word itself is negative. But in the context of a review of a baby stroller, unpredictable is not a good thing. So it's, it's really negative there. So without un identifying that context where you know, unpredictable baby stroller or unpredictable movie, you're not, you're not going to really do well in terms of uh, coming up with a sentiment score. So in this example for the commodity futures prediction where you are trying to predict the futures of corn, um, the, the two tweets, the top one actually speaks about a cool recipe 
for con. You know, first off, that's not very relevant, but even if you were to extract the word cool in that tweet and classify it as positive, it is actually referring to a recipe. But in the second example, it speaks about how cool and damp weather leads to poor yield forecast for corn. So cool weather is actually a negative uh, sentiment, whereas cool um, recipe is a positive sentiment. So you have to be careful of uh, identifying context. Now, the way you would identify context is uh, by using parts of speech tagging. And uh, you know, there's a, a landmark paper by Peter Tooney uh, in 2002, which speaks about how would you do um, uh, uh, context extraction from any sentence using parts of speech tagging. Now, the idea is very simple. Now, let's say you have a sentence. You've tagged parts of speech so that you know that you know, what words are verbs, what are nouns, what are adjectives, adverbs, so on and so forth. The algorithm is as follows. So you first apply parts of speech tagging to a sentence. And then there are some rules which says that every time an adjective is followed by a noun, extract that pair. Likewise, every time an adverb is followed by a verb, extract that pair. And likewise, you know, perhaps a noun is followed by adjective is also another rule. So given a sentence, you extract such uh, contextual cues from that sentence. And then you have to come up with a way of identifying a polarity for each phrase. So let's take the example of cool weather, right? Now, we don't yet know whether cool weather is a positive phrase or it's a negative phrase. And one way to, to, to be able to deduce that is if you had a large collection of um, tweets and you identified that cool weather occurred very frequently in the neighborhood of a positive word like excellent uh, and perhaps very infrequently with a negative word like poor, so then it means that cool weather is positive compared and not negative. So likewise, you can have a dictionary of strongly positive words, a dictionary of strongly negative words, just like the example with unpredictable. And using this phrase extraction rules, you can ultimately come up with a score, a polarity score for every phrase. And then the sentiment associated with your tweet itself is some sort of an average over all the polarity scores you've identified in your tweet. Now, this is a very simple algorithm, but it works well in practice. And the beauty with this is that it is unsupervised, so you don't have to pay a human being to tag a large collection of tweets with a positive or a negative score, and then go on to doing sentiment analysis. Now, let's look at how we do this in parallel so that it can scale to a really large data set. Now, to summarize, you know, we have a data which we get from GNIP. GNIP was a provider of Twitter data. Now, they are part of Twitter themselves. So we then apply part of speech tagging. Once we apply part of speech tagging, the end result of that is the phrases that we've extracted using the rules that I spoke of previously. And once we've assigned a polarity score with the phrases using this, this dictionary of positive and negative words and the technique that I spoke of, you can identify the sentiment associated with a tweet by averaging the, the scores of their corresponding phrases. Now, the way we do that in this pipeline uh, that we built for our customers was, uh, well, first off, you have data coming from uh, Twitter. We have about 55 million tweets a day. You need to store this data as it keeps coming. Otherwise, you know, you're going to overwhelm the feed that you get from your provider. So we just uh, do some filtering on this. We do some pre-processing, and then we dump it into a data lake. Once we've dumped it into a data lake, we use a Pivotal Extension Framework, which is a collection of Java libraries, if you will, which uh, works on top of the SQL on Hadoop engine to extract out information from these tweets. So uh, uh, the data that you get is typically just a JSON blob. So you want to extract information about who posted it, what time it was posted, how many followers they have, how many retweets they have, because all of these are ultimately going to be really useful for you. And then using PL Java, we do the part of speech tagging. And once we do part of speech tagging, we extract these phrases that we previously described. And ultimately, we can then present these results uh, using a dashboard where you can see uh, you know, the positive and negative tweets. And I'll show you a demo in, in just two minutes. So here's the Spring XT component, right? So a Spring XT component, Spring XT in general has four broad components for those of you who've attended any of the other talks might be familiar with. So first off, uh, you, you have a Spring shell. Uh, you, you create a single node edition of, of, of Spring XT, and then you create a, a, you know, a, a source to destination pipe. So in this case, the source is an HTTP source, and the destination, or the sync in this case, is HDFS. So all it's saying is listen in on this port where you're getting data from 
Twitter or from GNIP, and it is telling you, and it's telling Spring XD to start writing out the results at this location on HDFS and roll it into a new file after every one gig of data that you collect. And then if you want to destroy this particular tap, you just say, you know, you use the destroy command. So here's how a raw JSON stream is going to look like. And then what we do is we extract uh, two tables out of this. So there is a table of poster information which contains, you know, who tweeted it, how many followers do they have, how many retweets that that receives, so on. And it's also got information about their location, if they've got any description in their profile, that's really useful. In the scenario where we were trying to predict commodity futures, we wanted to upweight the tweets which came from people who actually described their professions as related to farming, as opposed to those who are just retweeting some news article, because that is not as valuable as someone who's really a farmer and who's, look, who's, who's observing conditions on, on his own field. So once we've extracted the tweet information and the poster information, uh, by the way, here's how we do it. Again, these slides are going to be shared on SlideShare. We've already uh, posted links. We've tweeted it so you can take a closer look at it. Apologies for Microsoft acting up. But uh, what we have is an external table definition. So on the top left, we've defined the structure of the JSON um, content. So you have actor information. You have the body of the tweet, when it was posted, so on and so forth. And on the right-hand side, uh, sorry, on, on the bottom left-hand side, actually, you tell where in your HDFS path are the raw JSON files being stored. So you remember the Spring XD, which is writing to HDFS, and you're telling it that at this path, go and look for all tweets. And once you receive that JSON blob, PXF will actually do the parsing because it's got that intelligence baked into it to parse a JSON stream. So even when you have nested objects where you have a dict, and inside that dict, one key has another dict, and that dict has a key and another dict. You can specify a recursive uh, extraction of uh, the objects of interest. So in this case, where we are trying to um, extract uh, actor information, you can see that I say a.b.c. And when you do the extraction, uh, PXF can actually pull that information out. So the end result is through that external table definition, I've created a poster information, and I've created a tweets table itself, which contains the actual tweets of interest. And now we are going to do sentiment analysis. All right. So now comes PL Java, the interesting part, and most of this talk is going to be about this. So for PL Java, it's basically just Java, but it's got a bunch of SQL wrappers like the snippets I had showed to you before. So the first thing that you do is you define what is called as a user-defined type. So a record is a collection of different fields. Those fields don't have to be of the same type. It can be a composite type. So for example, what we want to extract is, given a tweet, we want to extract for every token in that tweet what is its index in that tweet, and what is its corresponding part of speech, you know, whether it's a verb, noun, or 20 other things, which is the, the vocabulary space of parts of speech tags. Now, having defined that, I define the user-defined function itself. That's the bottom part. So all that says is, you know, tag POS, that's the function name. It takes a varchar as input, and then it says it returns a set of records which are of the type that you've just defined. So the first part of that record is an index. The second is the token itself, which you could think of as a word in a tweet. And the third is a, a parts of speech tag associated with that token. And I'm directly calling what uh, you might be familiar with is a Java class. So there's a, there's a Java package called POSTAGger, which I've written. And within that, you know, there's an NLP, uh, there's a sub-package called NLP, and within that there's a POS tagger class. And the function in the POS tagger class, which actually does the part of speech tagging, is called tag tweet. And when you invoke this function like so using a select query, you can see the results coming up. Now, this is a classic data parallel problem. So if you have a table containing 100 million tweets, every tweet can be tagged in parallel using whatever the parts of speech tagger you're using. So each of that computation can happen in a different node, and the master node can collate that. So classic data parallel scenario, so you can really make it scale to large data sets. 
Again, a lot of this is not going to be too clear, but basically on the left-hand side, I have the actual Java class definition itself. I'm using a library from the Carnegie Mellon University called ArcTweet NLP. That's got the state-of-the-art results in parts of speech tagging accuracy for Twitter. And all I'm doing is I'm first instantiating a model from that Java package. So basically, I take the jar file associated with ArcTweet NLP. I distribute it across all nodes in my environment. And then I write this function. And this function loads that jar file. And then I have a function which I've written called tag tweet, which basically invokes the jar files tag method. And the end result of this is the record that I just described, where you have an ID, uh, sorry, you have an index, you have the tweet, and you have its corresponding parts of speech. And on the right-hand side, it's basically an iterator, which given a list of rows in SQL, it can recursively you know, iterate through those rows, and it can invoke the parts, parts of speech tag. Uh, parts of speech tagger on that. All right. So with that, I just wanted to finish off with a demo and um, hand it over to Jared. So putting all of these pieces together, we have this demo running. So um, So you're presented with this interface where on the back end you have a huge corpus of tweets, and then you're provided with a search interface. So it's like a data lake. You can see a bunch of you know, ships floating. And in the search interface, you can query for any topic of interest. And we want to see a sentiment analysis of those tweets, and we also want to see what are the topics of conversation. And since we are in DC, what better topic could you pick than, say, Obamacare? So let's search for Obamacare. Um, so I enter this, and what's going to happen is, first off, we have an index built on all those tweets. So we are going to retrieve all tweets matching the word Obamacare, and then we are going to do sentiment analysis of it. We are also going to look at topics of conversation when people tweet about Obamacare. And then we look at some interesting tag clouds and some heat maps, so on and so forth. So I click Enter, and you can start seeing information bubbling up from the uh, data lake. So in interest of time, what I'm going to do is switch to uh, another tab where we have this result pre-rendered. It takes about 45 seconds to a minute for it to get rendered, but here's a pre-rendered version of the same if it shows up. All right. So you can see, first off, <laughs> the resolution. Yeah, so when I change the screen resolution, I just messed it up. But generally, to get the idea, it first shows you a time series plot. You know, there's no machine learning involved here at all. So first off, you can hover over different points in time to see how many times did uh, the word Obamacare occur in tweets at different points in time. And if you were to click on any point here, it'll refresh the sidebar to show you what were the tweets which match the search word Obamacare at that point in time. And this might be useful for drill down analysis to see why do you have a spike in interest in Obamacare at different points in time? Why is there a waning interest in the same? Now, this is where the next level of analysis comes in. So here you want to do sentiment analysis. So here, the green, red, and, uh, and, and the blue lines indicate positive, negative, and neutral tweets. So using the part of speech tagger and the rule extractor and the sentiment scorer, we've come up with these three time series. And you can see that you know, there's been a surge in interest in Obamacare, I don't know, around July 9th. And if you click on that, it'll show you what fraction of the tweets on that particular day was positive, what was negative, and what was neutral. And down here, you will be able to see what those corresponding tweets were. And this, again, is useful for drill down analysis to see if there's been any campaigns which led to a surge in the sentiment or you know, uh, you know, a fall in the sentiment, for instance. Now, that is the, the direct result of applying our sentiment analysis algorithm on, on the tweets. Now, you can also do some more interesting things, like, for instance, you want to look at um, uh, you know, a heat map, like when do people tweet about Obamacare, for instance. Uh, if this rendered correctly, uh, which it did on my laptop but not on the screen, you will see that on the, on, on the rows you have days of the week, and on the columns you have hour of day. So you can identify you know, using this heat map, like when do people mostly tweet about Obamacare, and if, for instance, you look at Thursday at 5 p.m., It'll, it'll start refreshing um, it work. It'll start refreshing the tweets which match that particular point in time and that particular point in, 
in date. Now, this again is useful for drill down analysis. Now, since we've extracted parts of speech, we know what are the adjectives associated with tweets matching the word Obamacare, and you can render that in, in, in the form of a tag cloud. And if you hover over it, it'll tell you what fraction of these tweets uh, contain this adjective. So you can see you know, a lot of adjectives associated with Obamacare. And again, if you click on those, you'll see what those tweets actually mean. Again, useful for drill down analysis. Then ultimately, we do a topic analysis. Now, this is where it's, uh, in, you know, it's useful to identify when people talk about Obamacare or any search word for that matter, there are different topics of conversation. So for instance, are they talking about defunding it? Are they talking about you know, Senator Ted Cruz's speech about Obamacare you know, when he went on a tirade like three years ago, two years ago, actually? So you can deduce that automatically by using what are called as topic models. So in this case, we use something called as uh, latent Dirichlet allocation. And every node, uh, the color of every node in this topic graph that you see on the left corresponds to a topic. And a node itself corresponds to a tweet. So you can hover over them and see what those topics are. And if you wanted to see what the orange topic was, you could just click on it. And you will see the tag cloud highlighting what that particular topic was about. Likewise, if you were to click on the blue cloud, you will see the blue uh, highlighted. Now, this is useful in identifying these topics of conversation. So if you're building um, you know, a brand uh, identification or the effectiveness of a campaign, uh, a machine learning model which ultimately feeds into such a dashboard uh, which is deployed on Cloud Foundry is very effective in communicating your results and insights. And this is typically what we do for our customers. And with that, I wanted to hand it over to Jared. Okay, hey, awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about a, a framework for real-time monitoring and uh, prediction of sensor data. Um, so we hear a lot of use cases come along with, uh, you know, analyzing, analyzing sensor data after it's already being collected. And as data scientists, that's kind of where we like to live, right? We uh, have the data, we can start modeling it, and then we can push these um, models out into um, start, you know, creating value. Take, people can start taking action on those and so forth. Um, but for me, it was a little bit abstract, right? So I wanted to kind of dive into this a little bit more. So I actually experimented with a project and um, have kind of unlevered or, or built up a um, framework, which is uh, now I've used time and time again to actually um, pull in both sensor data, but really any streaming data as well. Um, so to get started here, um, just talk about kind of the explosion of sensor data. So um, Sarah touched on this quite a lot um, during her talk. Um, but really what we see is a lot of businesses and organizations now are starting to add sensors to all their um, kind of operational equipment and um, you know, really trying to optimize and get a better view of what's happening within their kind of day-to-day -day activities, right? And I have a, a few examples up here, um, you know, in terms of the, the amount of data that's coming off some of these sensors. Um, so the GE um, turbine engine is, is pretty impressive here, and unfortunately, I don't have these numbers um, kept in mind. I can't see it on the screen over here anymore, but um, yeah, roughly a terabyte of data on a, on a cross-country trip, um, which is pretty impressive. I've actually read in other places that there's roughly 6,000 sensors now that they're putting on Boeing wings and so forth, so this number is going to kind of explode as you look at the whole plane in, in total. Um, connected cars, we're hearing a lot of, um, you know, it, data or information coming out about this. Um, Sarah had an example of Tesla there. Um, some numbers I got was roughly 25 gigabyte can come off these per hour, um, cranked up. And you can imagine as we become more autonomous with our driving, um, that's even going to explode even more there. And um, another kind of car example um, is the kind of F1 cars, which have been using sensors for quite some time now. Um, you know, last year at the um, uh, Grand Prix in Austin, um, it was said that roughly 243 terabytes of, of data was brought off the, the cars during the race. Um, so these are huge numbers and very exciting for us as data scientists to then go and kind of model this data. Um, but the, how do you take action on that, right, of a, a car's kind of racing around the track, right? We don't want to kind of step away, model, and, and then produce a model and it's only going to affect the next race, right? So we need to become more timely about that. Um, there's a lot of value that comes from actually putting sensors on everything. And here's some um, uh, kind of numbers that I've pulled up on the, the web here. And there's some links down the bottom. You can kind of chase down the, the underlying articles. Surprisingly, pretty, pretty hard to find ROI numbers on and instrumenting and, and putting sensors um, on items. And that's because it's still pretty new, right? A lot of companies are 
starting to do this, but they're getting their competitive advantage. So they don't want everyone else to know about it, right, um, at this point in time. But I, I found a few examples, and these are pretty compelling, right? So there's a uh, mining industry over here on the, the far right. Um, they're quoted as saying by adding you know, sensors to their machinery and their miners going down underground, um, they're able to lower production costs from $60 down to $40 a ton, right? which is pretty impressive when these guys are uh, pushing through thousands and thousands of tons. Um, the US government, um, they were essentially added a bunch of sensors to a few of their data centers or, or facilities housing all their servers. Um, and they were kind of interested in the um, power consumption that was going on primarily around um, providing air conditioning to those um, server rooms. And the number here, of, um, they essentially said they lowered it 17% um, in, in one facility. So that's, that's pretty impressive as well. And then um, finally over here on the, the left, or your right, is um, a quote from UPS. Um, so they did a pilot study initially putting um, sensors on 10,000 of their trucks, and uh, now I believe they're rolling it out to their entire fleet. Um, and essentially what they were able to identify is um, through these sensors that there was times when the trucks were actually sitting idle um, that they could actually get rid of. And by removing that 15 minutes of idling time across all their drivers and doing some other optimization, they were able to reduce um, the gallons per driver per year by um, roughly 25 gallons, right? So when you kind of blow this up over their entire fleet, it came to roughly 1.4 million gallons annually that they can save just by adding some sensors and then running the follow-up analysis on those. Getting back to where I started here, right? This is all still pretty abstract. Like, how does UPS go from you know applying a, a sensor actually to a truck to collecting this data and driving insights, right? Um, so we have a, a little experiment set up here, uh, built out a, a Hadoop cluster. Um, these are some old uh, servers that we found on eBay. I think they're from like 2006. Some some business somewhere probably junked them. Um, pulled together some racks and so forth off Craigslist and, and pulled together this um, little server room here, or, or server room, I should say. It was more like a, a closet in my spare bedroom. Um, and you know, initially I was thinking, let's put these, these together, and it was really a test around getting all the different components of Hadoop working. Um, but very quickly, once I put the first one in and started it up, I hit this, this problem of not realizing how much heat is, comes off these things, right? Um, so this is in Atlanta, Georgia, where I was running this test, and uh, pretty, pretty hot out there and humid outside. Um, and then also in, inside the house, you know, even though it was air conditioning, um, having just one of these servers on in this um, closet is roughly six by four. Um, heated it up over the safe operating temperature in a little under two hours. Um, so obviously as I went to scale up and add the other three uh, servers on here, um, I was in trouble, right? I couldn't essentially run these things. Um, so I needed to kind of figure out a, a solution to that. And what was the solution? Add an air conditioning unit. So again, I uh, hit up the, the Craigslist and, and found an old AC, which I then uh, applied to the system, and now we had cooling. But now I'm thinking, well, you know, I've, I've kind of set this all up here and um, switched it all on, and actually it initially all, all started to work, and I ran my first MapReduce job, and all the power in my house went down, and I uh, figured out, you know, in a typical townhouse, it's 15 amp circuits, right? So when your servers are running at lo low consumption, not a heavy load, they're pulling not, not that much, but as soon as you run a MapReduce job and everything starts firing off, all of a sudden you're sucking too much, and the breakers all, all go off. Um, so after doing some, some rewiring and so forth, I ended up having a, a separate circuit for this AC unit. And as you can imagine here, all these kind of problems I'm having in this kind of test environment are things that are very common to larger businesses as well. Um, so we ended up having this, this AC unit on a separate circuit, but now, circuit now I had this issue where, well, if the um, power goes off in my house and comes back on, the servers will all switch back on, but the air conditioner won't. So I'm going to automatically overheat and say I'm off traveling somewhere. I have no way of even knowing this is happening. So I could come back not only to the servers being down, but also my house on fire, which was not good. Um, so I'm still kind of have an issue here with um, overheating. And now I'm also concerned with power consumption, right? And essentially what's happening is this environment or this system is becoming more and more complex as I'm adding more pieces into it. And so the way you kind of solve for this complexity is through data science. So what I needed to do is start collecting data on this, this system. 
So I have some logs, you know, um, set up. Uh, Gangly, I believe, was the, the program I was using to um, kind of capture the logs of the workload of the servers themselves. But I needed to get an understanding of the, the temperature. Um, and so these are the, the sensors I, I picked up here. Um, for actually close to the server, I picked up these little USB sensors. Here's, here's one here off Amazon. Um, they essentially plug in and, and start um, capturing readings. Um, for the temperature sensors outside, so in the, the actual bedroom itself, and then I also wanted one outside of the brick wall that the closet was up against, I um, essentially put together a small Arduino package with these um, LM35 temperature sensors on there as well. And so what this allowed is now I'm collecting all this, this data from all over, and I can solve for the complexity of the environment that I've built by kind of solving these kind of three use cases here. And one is I want to be able to monitor the, just the temperature of the environment remotely. Um, I want to kind of predict an alert um, to potential you know, failures that are happening both within the AC and the servers themselves, um, which could cause overheating or other issues. Um, and then I also wanted to get an idea of optimizing the actual a AC temperature itself, right? I had a, a setting on the top that I could set to say, you know, what do I want it to run at? And there was a lot of power being sucked up by this, as you can imagine. Um, so I definitely wanted to kind of have the room as hot as possible with still being in the, the safe operating range. And, um, you know, throughout the day, um, uh, the, the temperature is going up and down, right, throughout the day. And um, also within my house itself, we can tended to keep it a little bit cooler at night than during the daytime. So there's these external factors that are also coming into play here. All right. So it's not just as easy as kind of buying one of these little sensors and kind of throwing them on a server, right? You now need to somehow pick up the readings that are kind of streaming off of this um, and collect that information in order to model it, and then also kind of use these results to solve some of those use cases. And very early on, we started kind of hitting uh, a lot of the challenges that I actually hear a lot of the customers that are coming to us with sensor data saying that they're, they're kind of hitting, right? And these are um, kind of start off in the, the data collection phase. So what, what happens is a, if a sensor fails, right? Um, so there's this really obvious example of it just stops working, you stop getting readings. Um, but there's also, you know, other things that can happen in terms of failure. You stop getting accurate readings, right, and they start going out of range. Um, the sensors can also become detached from the system. So this was a test environment for me. Um, this was actually my first time kind of getting my hands dirty on, on Spring XD. So there was lots of times where I was shutting down streams and starting them back up and so forth. And so during all those times, I didn't want to have gaps in my data. So I needed to kind of solve for this issue of what happens if this inf the information is still coming off the sensors, but now the environment's no longer capturing that. So it needs some kind of caching or queuing mechanism there to hold that for at least some period of time. Um, the sensors may not be co-located, right? I had these uh, USB ones in, actually in the rack themselves, um, pretty straightforward. If you get one of these, a side note is you can't plug them directly into the machine. It gets too hot back there. They don't give an accurate reading. You need to get an extended cable, which I learned the hard way. Um, but for the ones that are sitting on the Arduinos that are outside, they're, they're not co-located, right? And that's the same thing you know, UPS and these other um, organizations are dealing with, but in a kind of larger scale, right? And then finally, um, you know, integrating external data. So we'll go into the modeling portion a little bit here, but I actually use a time series model. And instead of predicting out so many periods ahead of time without using kind of up-to-date data, I actually predicted using predicted values. And so for something like external weather, um, what I actually did was pull in some new weather data. So I had the kind of 10-day forecast, which was um, a little bit more accurate than what I could develop on my own at that stage. Um, the second challenge is with data volumes. Um, so here, you know, um, data was kind of small. I think over the, the six months, I was getting up by like 10, 10 gigabytes or something, not that large, but no point in kind of building a system when I'm dealing with big data all day that doesn't handle big data, right? So I wanted to make sure that there, this um, kind of framework that I was building out was gonna scale. Um, and then there's this kind of trade-off between kind of granularity and, and data volume that you have to kind of think about at that point. So you wanna have as much data as possible for the data science portion of it, the, the modeling. Um, also just the kind of um, looking at the graphs themselves, you want to be able to drill into a you know, very fine grain level, you know, seconds or minutes. Um, but there's some kind of volume, data volume that's um, trade-off that's there, right? 
Um, also wanted to put the data in a place that allowed for kind of rapid access and modeling. I was planning to do data science on this the whole time to save the use cases, so no point in kind of throwing the data somewhere that I can't access it easily. And for me, that means SQL. Um, then we kind of get into the, the measurement piece here. And, um, you know, handling missing values is, is something in um, non-clean data is something that happens a lot within sensor data. So Sarah talked a lot about the noise that occurs um, with these USB sticks, actually, when I was running on the Ubuntu system, um, the driver that I was using would actually drop out every five seconds. So if it happened that the reading happened at exactly that point in time, I had a missing record there. And, you know, I'm not a hardware guy. I wasn't going to go in there and hack away with it. It was something that I felt like I would just deal with later on down the road. So I had these random kind of missing points along the way. Um, which is also very, very common, right? Wi-Fi drops out or, um, you know, sensor goes bad and so forth. Um, another kind of issue you hit is um, if you have a kind of application sitting on top of this and you're streaming data in, you have all these aggregate metrics, how many readings did I get today, or for instance, right? Um, and then the system shuts off and you reboot. Where does that data come from, right? If you're keeping an aggregate, aggregator going, um, you need some way of pulling it from some disk layer, right? And then on the machine learning side, I won't go too much into these. Sarah talked about a lot of these problems, but you know, feature engineering for real-time scoring. You know, think about the complexity of the features, um, what kind of range that they're using. So as the data is coming in, you're not spending a bunch of time kind of pre-aggregating, building these features that may not be necessary. So there's um, a little bit more kind of thinking than I would in a kind of typical exercise where I'm trying to get the, the best model performance. There's some trade-off going on here. Um, and then finally, I, I'll talk a little bit about ba um, batch versus online training. Um, in this instance, I was using batch modeling, and so I had to retrain the model at certain points in time. So understanding the kind of indicators and getting to when I should actually make that retraining was important. Um, so what do I mean by batch and online training? And there's kind of two ways to think about modeling kind of real-time data. Um, one is the offline sense, and this is uh, essentially I'm going to collect a bunch of my sensor information, um, store it in a database somewhere. Um, I'm then going to go ahead and train my model over there, estimate my coefficients and so forth. Um, then I actually take that model and go publish it into a, um, a mechanism that then can score the data in real time. So there's no modeling going on at that point. I'm essentially just applying the algorithm that came out of the model um, to the streaming data. Um, this kind of simplifies the process a little bit. Um, but there's also the other kind of way of thinking about it here, and this is the online learning. And this is as the data comes in, I'm going to kind of train my model and create a prediction. Um, there's lots of trade-offs between these, and as we kind of see this field mature a lot, we actually see a lot of hybrid approaches, um, especially in big data a lot. We also use kind of single pass streaming algorithms, which, which could apply on the online learning sense, just because the data is so big, we only want to pass once. Um, so, Lots of hybrid, um, as I said there, but I kind of went with the um, approach on your left there, which was the, the batch. Okay, um, so Watson talked about this, and I, I assume most know Spring XD. Um, essentially, I was using this as the kind of core component of this framework I'm about to um, present here. Um, this was the kind of pipe or, or taking the data from the source location or these sensors, um, and essentially sending that out to HDFS or Hadoop. Um, in the middle there, there was a processor. Um, so I could have used, actually, SpringXD now has a um, PMML um, opportunity. So I could have built the model in R and then output PMML, which is essentially a way of um, standardizing uh, model storage, um, and then sent that out, actually, into SpringXD's um, scoring capability and run it there. Um, for this example, I actually developed a, a scoring mechanism in Python and called that from um, in a process here. Um, and then we use the Spring XD jobs to essentially kick off the retraining of the model. And then we had taps, and these were the aggregators that were kind of feeding our, our real-time um, application that was sitting on the top. Um, there's several other tools used in this process, Python um, scripting language here. This was used actually to kind of capture the information coming off the sensors and then send them um, through to RabbitMQ. I also use Python for the scoring mechanism. Um, RabbitMQ in here is this is how I kind of solve for the issue of um, when the system goes offline, right? Um, so here RabbitMQ is used as a kind of queuing system. So um, essentially your readings go in and Spring XD is now using that as the source and pulling off the readings out of that queue. 
Um, now when Spring XD goes offline, um, essentially that queue just becomes longer and longer there in, the, uh, in Rabbit. Um, so that's kind of how I solved for that. Um, then I use Hawk as my SQL language, so that's kind of solved for the issue of um, having access to that data. Um, R and Madlib um, used for the modeling component. Watson and Sarah both talk about Madlib there, highly scalable, but also there's the advantage of it's all in SQL, right? I'm already living in this, this SQL world in, in Hawk and accessing this data, um, no reason to pull it out. Um, R is on the, the screen there as well because I use a vector autoregressive model, which was uh, not available in Madlib. And then finally, Redis was my kind of in-memory store, which um, held the information that then fed the, fed the real-time application. So what does this framework look like? Um, so there's two versions here. They both could be overlaid on top of each other. Um, you could do offline and online learning at the same time. Um, but essentially how it worked is I had the, the sensors. Um, Python was then capturing this information and sending it off to um, RabbitMQ. Um, RabbitMQ is essentially building up a queue of these, which um, is my source. Um, the Spring XD stream then sent that information over to HDFS. Um, so initially, I let this run for some period of time. Um, once I had enough data to start training my model, then I kicked off a, a batch process here, um, which developed the model and then pushed it out into my Python scoring mechanism, which was then um, used as one of the processes that was queued off um, every time a new data point came into that stream. Um, and then a tap was used to essentially capture that information and, and send um, the aggregates around, you know, average temperature and so forth back to um, the application that sits on top. So how would this look like in the online sense, right? Um, we don't need the, the batch component here. Um, so instead, we're essentially using a tap to send the information that comes through off to our online um, learning system, which again could be Python or R. So what does this uh, kind of look like um, for the, the server room test case in terms of modeling? Um, so I had a few data sources here, um, several sensors, again, from inside the actual server room itself, um, inside the rack, I mean, another one inside the server room. The outside temperature, I, I was very surprised to find out how much the temperature goes through um, drywall, right? If you have temperature on one side, it'll actually um, equalize on the other side of the wall, all things I learned during this, this process. And then again, the external data. Um, so essentially, the, the process was here, once I had um, kind of cached up enough of that in HDFS, uh, the sensor data, I started integrating all of this together and going through the process of cleaning. Um, so things like missing data, I just essentially did a very basic imputation, um, taking the value, uh, the previous value, and adding it in there. However, I did set up a catch to say that if I was missing multiple values, then I needed to take a smarter approach about it. Um, then kind of integrating these together, very straightforward join in terms of everything had a timestamp, right? Um, so we could kind of merge on that. And then going into the kind of out of uh, feature generation here. Um, so for the top models, um, essentially for each sensor, what I did was created a model which predicted um, what the next temperature readings were going to be. Um, and so for this, we used uh, ARIMA um, and VAS, um, vector order aggressive, uh, essentially the same thing, but um, when you're looking at multiple time series that may have interactions between them. Um, and then also to solve for the, the issue of uh, kind of failure within the system, um, used logistic regression, actually in this case, and spot vector machine um, to kind of model that um, yes or no instance. And Sarah actually talked a lot about this in, in her use case. Um, so these kind of things uh, apply across many, many verticals here. And so the output of this was essentially to kind of answer those three initial use cases, right? I wanted to access this data remotely, um, so build a very lightweight Node.js app. It's pretty disgusting looking up there, even worse when you actually see it on the screen. I'm not an app developer, but I essentially got the job done, right? I was able to log in at any point here and see in real time um, you know, what the readings were. Um, and there was drill down capabilities and so forth, but um, also just had the essentially automated alerting, right? Um, so in my case, I was um, just set it up by email. Um, so every time something was acting a little fishy within the system, such as my observed versus predicted started diverging too far, um, I set it up to essentially queue off a, an alert to me. 
Um, in this case, I wasn't too worried about false positives, right? I sent it to a, another Gmail account, which I could just go in and have a look at, but there was that kind of trade-off there, which is how many alerts do you actually want to get, and you have the parameters that you need within that um, kind of basic case statements um, to kind of set those. So what are the kind of key takeaways from this? And uh, essentially it's that um, organizations are embracing, um, you know, adding sensors and creating a lot of value um, from adding sensors to their operational um, uh, equipment, right? Um, many challenges exist with working with this, but Spring XD can actually solve for a lot of these using a framework as I pre presented today. Um, but really having the flexibility to plug and play things such as R or Madlib, Python, um, is really crucial in making these systems kind of robust and having a lot of users access them, which again, um, Spring XD played a huge role in making this happen within this framework. Cool, so we kind of rushed through a whole lot here today, a little bit of drinking from the fire hose, I'm sure, but we actually have a bunch of information available up on the, the Pivotal blog. Um, so if you uh, want to go out there and check that out, here's a few examples of some of the, the blogs that are available out there and, and many more. Uh, and definitely good reads, and you'll also see the links in there to the data scientists. We love getting um, notes about it and questions on, on what you're reading there. So um, definitely reach out as you go through those. And for further information, um, you can check out some of these links here. Thank you all very much for your time.